to the recaps. So today we're gonna do the recap of the round five of the candidates. So let's go right into it. The first game was uh, Prague versus Nepal. In this game, uh, the Indian prodigy managed to catch Jan in the opening prep. It was an amazing preparation in the Petrov. Petrov is utilized by Jan quite a lot, especially when he wants to solidify his advantage, play solid chess, but you know, it's not very likely the opening for him, to be honest, um, especially when we look at the match that he played versus Magnus. Still, very solid opening, unless you prepare something, it's very hard for to get an advantage. Um, so one of the old main lines, c4, knight c3, bishop f5. They used to play bishop g4 here, but, uh, you know, h3, bishop h5, g4 is uh, this to some very sharp lines, and uh, you really have to know them, know this theory. Not knight e5, but bishop g5, apparently, yeah? and then knight h4. So things that get very, very tricky. You really need to remember the analysis. Bishop f5 has been main lines for, for quite some time because black realizes the importance of this diagonal, safety of his king, but also tries to complete the development. If black completes the development, then black is completely okay. So every, every move now is uh, absolutely important. So bishop g5, and uh, again, the queen is being pushed, so you can play knight h4 and kick this bishop out of this important diagonal. So queen a5, and the reason for queen a5 is it's not only counterattack on the pawn, but the white attacks the bishop. There is counterattack on the bishop c4, and recapture of this bishop. So now we have the position with opposite color bishops, and uh, again it looks like white has something, but it is extremely fleeting, and white has to be precise to play for an advantage here. So there are two moves: bishop b3 and bishop h3. Uh, the computer suggests also a queen b3 move, and um, yeah, but again, queen b3, queen c7, bishop uh, c4, knight d7, and this is considered to be a very, very solid position for black. Knight goes to f6, g6, king g7, rook e8, everything is under control, so white needs to come up with something. And uh, Prague plays bishop h3. So, um, the knight is first of all not allowed to go to d7. If the knight goes to a6, it's okay. But uh, the problem with knight on a6 is that it, it takes away this uh, square from the queen. It's also kind of lousy position. You really need this knight here so he can go to protect the king on f6. Or potentially after b5, the knight can go to b6. If the knight goes to a6, the only square for him to go to is c7, which is actually not bad. But then after that, uh, you know, the square is taken and a white plays c4, all this is taken under control. All right, so queen c3, black just goes and uh, takes the pawn because otherwise he will suffer. Now he will suffer for something at least. Rook b1, uh, counterattacking the pawn. And rook b3. <clears throat> so, so the whole point is that um, black's Queen side is underdeveloped. Uh, queen e2 is normal move, but uh, Prague prepares this idea. So after this move, um, the, the whole point is that, again, the position needs to be open. But I can't really play c5, uh, because this bishop will be attacked either by knight h4, knight g5, and uh, this pawn is uh, critical. Probably is knight g5, again, same idea with knight of 7 sack and uh, utilizing this pawn, taking control of these squares. Uh, but knight h5 is also very reasonable, because um, the queen and the queen side is so underdeveloped, black can just, you know, if he plays g6, it's still going to be knight f5. And you cannot take this pawn because king is completely naked, and white just wins the game. So black takes, now the knight has a chance to develop here, but rook knight g5 first. Because rook d3, then just knight c6 and bishop c5, black fully completed development, he's fine. The problem is this, this knight g5 move. 
because suddenly wine has serious threats and one of the most serious threats is to take on f7 and then bishop e6 goes into the attack mode uh, attacking this diagonal, this diagonal, queen h5 is the threat, but also knight e6. Uh, there is a lot of things to think about uh, here for black and um, that plays h6 which is pretty careless. Um, <clears throat> the most logical moves were g6 and bishop f4 try to get rid of this active piece and also get the bishop out. I think bishop f4 was like the safest. And the idea is that uh, if white takes here, then you can play knight a6, bishop here, knight c7. Protecting the pawn, attacking the bishop, and now white has to make a draw, pretty much. So that was uh, the most logical decision, but it's not easy to see. I mean, see here for me it's easy to commentate this, but yeah, <clears throat> h6. And of course, knight takes f7. Now, black has serious problems because, uh, first of all, it's a tempo. Uh, second of all, light squares are weak, and you must take this knight. If you take with the rook, uh, bishop e6 is pretty much a uh, terrible position. So, Nepo takes this with the king, and rook d3. Uh, apparently, this move is not the best move. a4 was better to put this queen with the tempo and then rook on d5 because after rook d3, Black has um, Nepo finds it, but he plays knight d7, and uh, bishop d7 is probably just an advantage because again um, opposite colored bishops, but maybe it's not too much. Yeah, so I think if he goes here, then king g8, rook d5, bishop c5, and uh, Black survives this because king goes to h8. There is not bishop a4. White still has some threats like along the light squares. The attack is pretty dangerous, but there is a good chance for Black to survive this. Um, the reason being is if white goes for something like this, then there is always counterattack. <clears throat> yeah, it's kind of kind of a weird position. And now I see white is actually much worse. So um, again, this is all analyzed at home. Um, Prague just plays rook d5, the best solution. Nepo makes this amazing uh, knight c5, careless move again. Uh, except that in the games versus Magnus, <clears throat> he couldn't uh, make this careless move. Magnus punish, punishes him. But in this tournament, uh, you know, his opponents are a little bit more, you know, cautious. But bishop h2 taking this pawn was good. Black now has extra pawn and pretty much same position as before. And uh, his king goes to g8 anyway and knight takes away the square and black is fine. The, the difference is that now, you know, white keeps the pawn, he has uh, material equality, but the uh, white's advantage now is an undisputable because king is weak and uh, the bishop is able to transfer. So we get same position pretty much, but uh, now Prague has a winning chance, yeah? He must play something like queen e5. The idea is if king g8, then uh, white goes for an attack and there's this um, trick where check and leads to extra pawn for white with a serious advantage. So the computer suggests here um, just grabbing the pawn and um, going to this uh, position. <coughs> However, you know, uh, this is better for white because king is naked, the rook is here and uh, the h pawn is coming. So white has an attack and pawn majority and very strong bishop. Usually I like queens and knights versus queens and bishop, but when the rooks are present and when the king is open, you know, knight knight is really not that great. Especially if the bishop comes anywhere, this diagonal it is gonna be just a big disaster for black. So this was a good chance. It's not winning, but it's advantage for white. It's a big advantage. Instead, uh, Prague plays bishop f5 and uh, allows knight b7 after that. The game was forced into the end game, and in the end game, Black has very strong chances to equalize this. Um, I really not a big fan of this move. I think Bishop should be on e4, like a rook d8, then just rook d1. And uh, if White thinks uh, if Black, yeah, if White thinks he has nothing, he only has to study some games by uh, Fischer and where Fischer actually beat um, Taimanov in almost identical symmetrical position only because he had bishop and rook versus knight and rook. Bishop and rook is stronger in the endgame than these minor pieces. Okay, so white has some chances still to win this endgame, but you know, at least to press. 
Uh, the way he plays, uh, he tries to create uh, uh, threats around Black King, you know, push the pawns, maybe play g5, but the, 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 the thing is, uh, this knight comes into the game, and uh, white dreams are not happening, a nuance, but now attacks and g5, and um, now the pawns are steamed on the dark squares, bishop cannot touch the squares, and uh, it's getting closer and closer to the draw. The reason being, if you play rook e1, there is a um, very nice intermezzo, check, here, and uh, black is still a bit worse, but uh, after rook e6, he is okay. Alright, so, um, yeah, so this end game is already after g5, it's uh, almost drawn, so Prague tries something, but it's very hard to do. Yeah, I think rook c1, he, yeah, he still had some chances, like rook c1, create some pressure, but Nepo is very good in the end games. And I think Prague was a little bit disappointed with the way uh, game went because uh, he, he allowed his opponent to escape pretty much. A5, very correct defense, knight g6, knight transfers to the best square in the game for him. All the pawns on the dark squares opposite the bishop, right? No targets for the bishop. So white tries this, but trade, trade. Uh, rook d5 I think is better chance. The idea of rook d5 is to force black rook into passive square. And then, you know, sort of activate the king. A little bit better pawn structure, but of course it's a draw. Uh, he plays rook b7, and rook b7 is just a draw. All right. So this was a draw. A little bit disappointed uh, for um, Prague. Yeah, I'm going to uh, look at the games the way, the order they finished. Uh, the second game finish was Vidit. Yeah. So Vidit plays Rosalimo, which is a surprising choice because Fabiano usually plays Rosalimo on the white side. And yet here he plays on the black side, and the idea is, um, yeah, so this uh, c4, uh, allowing c4 is considered to be good for black, so I'm not sure why they did it allow this, yeah, knight c3 makes sense, for example, to develop this piece, but he probably has his reasons, he wants to stop e5, and he wants to put the knight on d2, which is probably better than on c3, uh, but allows c4, yeah, so... Now black gets rid of his uh, double pawns, but he's got a semi-closed position where the bishop, especially this bishop, is completely enclosed by white pawn structure, and uh, white knights are very strong. Yeah? There's some holes here in the black position. Still, it's not so bad. Queen c7, castles, long castles. Uh, looks dangerous for white to castle to this bishop, yeah? bishop and rook. But in reality, again, this bishop is closed. King is pretty safe. White can now hope to start aggression here because obviously black king is not going to be safe on the king side, but black king is not going to be safe on the queen side either because there is rook c1, knight b5 coming, calls to the knights are coming to the center. So not a simple position for black to play. Uh, if we have Fabiano plays very academic chess, knight d7. Uh, knight goes to control some squares, pawns and knight, and they control the entire center. Uh, it's a little bit passive, but okay, playable. And knight h4. White instinctively wants to get rid of black's pair of bishops, get some center, so understandable. And the computer really doesn't like this move, but in terms of human play, this move is actually pretty standard. The idea is that uh, black prepares to play b5, a4, go just open some files against this king and create an attack. Because if you don't do this, then black has to be uh, standing still, and it's not going to be so easy. Like e5, and then already a big problem for this queen, yeah. Because knight b5 is coming, or knight d5 at some point. So a5 is pretty human. Grab, grab. d4 is also human. The computer likes rook c1. Because the computer foresees this maneuver that the knight goes to c5, where you don't capture with the pawn, but you capture with the heavy piece and you prepare this pawn break in the center, all right? Because obviously black king cannot still castle short side, there is too much risk, white easily opens the, um, the king uh, defenses. So d4 and a4 is actually forced. This is forced because black otherwise is too late, white wants to play e5, knight e4, cement the central presence here, and then black king is forever stuck in the center. He will not be able to castle either side. Black can play knight d5, but okay, for example, um, 
So right now, actually, d5 is also a threat. So let's see, b5, e5, bishop here, yeah. Rook c1 or queen c2, actually, to make sure you don't get this threat. Knight b6, you lose the pawn, but the queen b7, for example, pretty standard, then knight e4, yeah. So we get this position, but again, one of the best tricks for white is to get rid of this bishop so you get access to the squares by playing bishop g5. And now white knight has access to some of these squares because bishop f8 um, allows white to dominate this position. All right. The reason is that rooks are disconnected, you can't castle, the critical square in d8 is taken, um, and most importantly the attack is coming. If white opens the h file, the rook comes to the h8, pinning this guy, the knight comes to d6 anyway. All right. So yeah, so the computer has some weird lines like king d7, but eventually, you know, it's still um, opening. Yeah, the position is getting opened. Knight c5, so bishop b7, bishop g5 back, and the bishop is traded, and eventually knight comes. So again, huge danger for black in terms of the uh, strategic uh, play. So that's why five plays a4. I think it's the only correct move actually, and the only thing is. I don't know about this knight a4. I mean, it looks good, and the game shows it's good, but you know, queen c2 is pretty safe, and the idea is to allow this and just close the queen side, okay? Just close the queen side, the knight is not here on b4, the bishop can be here, but white can dance around. But white king is kind of a little bit open, you know? So maybe it is equal, but I think white should be a little bit better, especially if this pawn on a3 is far, it's too far advanced. In the endgame, it's possible target for the bishop. So I think white's advantage is still here. But obviously, knight a4 is a principal move. There's nothing wrong with that. b5 and um, knight c5 is very safe. I would say knight c3 is um, uh, an adventurous move, but it also uh, carries significant risk for white. Yeah, your black pieces get active. The rooks come here. There's a lot of play for black. So knight c5 is uh, solid and also good. Grab, grab. So the question is why not bishop e5, yeah? Okay, so bishop e5 is possible, but um, um, it doesn't do much here. There is no attack on this uh, thing. White can play rook d3. Probably can play bishop g5. Um, yeah, but it, 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 it's still possible for sure. I mean, black probably will play the same way, yeah. Rook here, f3, and again, the big choice is where this king goes. There is no attack here. Like, if queen a5 trying to play rook b4, um, there's maybe just a3, right? This runs into bishop d2. Um, and if queen goes back, white is ready to play h4 finally, yeah. And then h5. So, white has extra pawn. Uh, black bishop and rook are very active. Pawn is not felt at the moment because these two like hold these three. But the biggest problem is that um, white is still going to open the position at some point. Maybe even f4, e5 is coming, and then take over this file. And um, definitely advantage white. But some counter play for black always. Yeah, bishop e7 is still uh, good because he wants to stop h4. All right, and the bishop can go to f6 also, just in case, also attacking this pawn. So h4, it's kind of hard to play for white here, but I think Vidi does a good job. Uh, bishop d4, I would probably play something like f3, but then black takes back his pawn, it's not clear how white can improve. But bishop d4 makes sense, uh, counter-attacking the pawn on g7, and Black plays this careless move a little bit and allows queen g3, after which uh, black position is now actually very, very dangerous. The problem is this is a huge tempo because the only way to protect this pawn is to play f6, but that allows g5 and immediately, you know, this pawn is being targeted and uh, black position is actually critical. So 5 he blundered actually, which is extremely uncharacter uncharacteristic of him. Uh, so he plays queen a7, tries to create some active counterplay. He probably thought this is good. But after queen here, queen g7, rook f8. Uh, this is actually uh, winning for white, but Virid had 11 minutes. Should be enough, actually. Black's only threat is to play check uh, related to this. Rook a1 and queen a4. 
Okay, so uh, White can just play King C2 here. It's an amazing uh, move, but if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. King just starts the run to the safe side. And considering that white has uh, connected rooks, centralized bishop, black king is very passive, bishop and rook are not playing. So queen and rook are the only active pieces that black has. And white king just runs, but they are neutralized by this uh, bishop. This bishop takes care of everything. Protects everything, protects the king, protects the pawns. And under this protection, this king can run to the king side. The king on g2 will be very safe. And once king is here, White's extra pawn and better position actually guarantees him a win. Yeah, it's amazing, but it's okay because he plays queen e5 and after queen e4 is just immediate draw because um, uh, the threat of mate doesn't leave white much of a chance. He wanted to play king c1, but unfortunately for him, after f6, the queen can no longer protect the bishop. So queen e6, check, and white loses the bishop with the check. Yeah, so. Just one mistake from Fabio lands him in the bad position and one mistake from Vidit converts the game from winning. And now he is forced to make the draw because again there is no defense against this threat of rook a1 and queen t4. And it is pretty amazing actually, just one move all it takes to lose an advantage. Alright, then we have the game versus um, Adresai versus Nakamura. And this was a big fight. Um, Italian, sort of quite opening, but again, these days Italian is considered to be main weapon uh, for white, yeah, to play for a win because there are no force lines, there are no force memorization lines, um, there's a lot of room to play uh, to demonstrate different plans, and in this game we see a very interesting plan demonstrated uh, by both players. Bishop e7, uh, traditionally bishop goes to b6, but bishop e7. And uh, castles, yeah. So a4, white expands, but black plays knight b, an amazing move. And this position now resembles the Philidor, or Brer actually. Um, very, very, very close to that. The, the whole point is that white puts the bishop and queen, and, and, and queen here committed to this diagonal. But black is now ready to use this to his advantage and play c6, d5 and actually uh, ca capture this bishop. The queen will have to go somewhere. In addition, uh, this knight can uh, go to d7 where he will do some good here, being on b6. Um, again, not simple, but very interesting idea by black. And uh, others are plays this. Yeah, I, I, I think he should probably... Uh, go into this line more and then queen c2 and now this becomes more of a uh, of a normal Italian game yeah or Spanish uh, shall we say yeah black will, or even Philidor yeah black will play in 87 queen c7 potentially put the bishop on b7 actually and white will play rook e1 knight f1 and just play normal chess yeah h3 um, this d4 feels, feels like you know white is trying to, very hard to you know to punch, yeah, uh, but he is underdeveloped and his pawn chain looks a little bit loose. Uh, so grab, grab, a5. Um, probably we're still in the preparation by Nakamura, or maybe not, because Naka is now down to one hour twenty-six. He spent half an hour, while Alreza spent only fifteen minutes. Yeah, so maybe it's Alreza's preparation. I don't know, or maybe both. <laughs> Yeah, so e5, yeah, a5 is a little bit weird. Um, normally, black plays d5 here, forces this um, doubling with the pawns at the cost of the pawn, but uh, and then black tries to win this guy, yeah. But here it's not so, not, not, so, not so easy because you have a5 and the square is taken, and this pawn you can only sort of block it, but it's still extra and it's also quite important. So, yeah, so the, the c6 is makes more sense, yeah, c6 does make more sense. Uh, and then white can play something like this, and then a5. <clears throat> I, I, I thought this was uh, interesting, but again, uh, the professionals, they know better, yeah. Apparently the agent thinks this is advantage white, because after c6, you have this hole, and the pawn chain is now a uh, compromise, and this is actually weak. So compared to the pawn on c7, you know, uh, 
he plays a5. Yeah, if you take on a5 now, uh, the knight can go back and get here. Very interesting. So e5, yeah. The, the, the big question is, if you play b5 now, then black can play it here, and knight goes to b6, and black is absolutely fine. And now the bishop has the square, and again, um, knight gets the square, right? And he recaptures the pawn. So that, that's the point. So that's why uh, Elisa plays e5, fighting chess, I like very, very much. But he's fighting with still king in the center. Yeah, so knight h5 is another fighting move by Nakamura. Knight f d7 would be a pretty normal move. Um, because e6 should not be able to do a lot of damage. But, okay, let's see it. And apparently the computer thinks that, um, you know, this is actually advantage white. Yeah, this actually may be a little bit better for white because um, after the bishop trade, the pawns will be on the square of the dark square bishop here on a7. This pawn is important, potential weakness for black. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's actually um, better for black, uh, better for white, yeah. So, knight h5 is, uh, becomes the first line move. Uh, it's not easy to attack this knight, and also in Spanish games, um, in lines like c3, d4, you know, this knight h5 is pretty popular. Uh, the knight can go to f4 and uh, protect all these squares. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a big fight here. Um, not, not, nothing is certain. b5 must be played, and white is threatening to complete the development and have the superior pawn structure in the center more space and attack yeah so black must do something so he plays knight f4 g3 uh, otherwise you know if you castle you must uh, accede to the bishop trade okay which is good for black because there is no more attack uh, in terms of uh, pawn structure this is uh, probably still better for white because even if you trade this bishop another bishop trade is coming and then black is still stuck with this weakness okay it's a little bit better for white. But Adriza wants to keep an attack, so he plays this move and bishop f1. The only thing I don't like is that he puts this bishop on g2. I don't think this bishop belongs on g2. It just feels wrong, man. It's like this now, it, it, it's really amazing how we're getting through all these stages uh, of the game with uh, pawn structure being adaptable. First it's Italian, now it's Spanish. But now what we have is actually a structure which is very similar to the Catalan. It, 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 it's, it's amazing uh, because the bishop is on g2, it's d4, d5, yeah? <laughs> and, and black plays c6, it's like Catalan now, man. Except that the knight is on e6, uh, unbelievable. All right, so castles, knight d7, uh, the computer says it's incorrect, black should play bishop d7, queen b6, apply pressure on this guy force the trade so the knight can develop to b4 square. And then it's equal. Uh, but Naka plays knight d7, he wants to put the knight here first, and then bishop on d7 to create pressure on this guy. So it makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, White's problem is that with a pawn majority like this, it is built for white to go for f4, f5 attack. All right? But how do you go for the f5 attack if uh, your knight has no moves? So like bishop, you need to play bishop b2, you need to remove this knight to e1 and play f4, because if you don't play f4, f4, black is going to utilize his pawn majority here and go either for the break c5 or start attacking these guys. So another way for white to play this would be to neutralize this important bishop, which is a huge defender, takes away the square from the knight, and also uh, supports uh, the pawn formation here. So bishop a3 here is absolutely critical for white. All right. And uh, he plays bishop b2 because he wants to move the knight and play f4, but later on he realizes that this bishop is important, okay? So bishop a3 was important move to trade this guy and then move the queen, play knight h4 and go for the break. I think that's the only way to, for white to play for an advantage here. Uh, he plays bishop b2 and uh, knight b6. Again, bishop goes to g7. So white wants to take before bishop arrives on c6. Bishop c3, uh, maybe rook c1 is better a little bit, but okay, Alreza, you know, he's a good player, yeah? We're not gonna criticize his moves, but they're very logical. Uh, rook fb1, correct, rook a6, now the rook on a6 is kind of bad, but this knight does a lot of things, protects this pawn, attacks this guy, 
you know, uh, controls the squares and he is out of the way. Yeah, you cannot touch this guy. So, uh, white takes. Yeah, white had now a choice to take on a5 and take on b6, but that's an end game, which is very likely to be a draw. And Alizai needs to win this. Yeah, Alizai needs to win because he has been minus one before this game. And uh, he need to, and they both were actually minus one. So it doesn't pretty much matter at this point, like um, whether if you're last spot or before the last spot. Yeah, these guys are fighters. They used to be playing for the top spots, both of them. And uh, they find themselves in this unique situation where they're both outsiders. So they go for blood and they need to, um, need to win so uh grab grab but as you can see now the bishop is very active queen b5 attacking the pawn queen c7 um and uh, he plays rook c1 yeah I'm, I'm i'm curious like what happens if he takes this pawn probably it's queen a7 yeah probably it's queen a7 creating this um thing here bishop b4 must be played and now the bishop d7 or um, knight a5, yeah. So bishop d7 is probably just uh, queen d3 somewhere. So knight a4 makes more sense. You're attacking this pawn, gotta take, take, and then rook a6, bishop a6. And again, this looks very much like a draw because you must play this move. And um, black is a little bit better because this bishop is passive, but it's very close to a draw. So um, white tries to, you know, Get rid of this bishop. This is the best piece right now. And one of the rules in chess, you, you need to get rid of your pawn's best pieces. Okay. So queen a7, queen here, and um, forces knight c4 to attack this bishop. So rook d1, queen a8. And uh, yeah, I, I like the way others play this part. He dances around, he pulls his pieces in a ways so he can get to the square. And he also puts um, black pieces in the awkward squares. He also got rid of this danger to his pawn on a4. So this was really well played, Alirizan. And now black makes a mistake, yeah? Because you really need this knight on e6. This knight does a lot of things here. Um, yeah, there is some tactical tricks apparently, but it's not so simple, but okay, let's see. Knight c5, take, take. And now it's Alirizan's chance to uh, get an advantage after this hard fought maneuvering phase. All he needs to do is to play knight d4 and prepare for f4. Because knight on d4 and then move the king and prepare for this pawn breaks, yeah? Which he, he waited for a long time. Also, knight can go to b5. Create pressure, you know, get to all these squares. It's an it's advantage. I am absolutely flabbergasted. I'm like, I don't understand how he can play this move. Instead of centralizing move knight d4 and then potentially knight b5 leading to a huge advantage, like rookie eight, yeah? Okay, knight b3 immediately wins, attacking both things. Yeah, so black probably must play this. And then knight goes to b5. Perfect place for the knight, threatening a lot of things. Then bishop d4, closing the file, and then opening the f4 thing. And then he goes knight h4. I really don't understand this. This is the move that changed the course of the game, in my opinion. After knight h4, you know, white cannot be better anymore. Take, take, rook a7. <clears throat> and now black is going for this c file. This knight is, I don't know, he wanted to play f4, but it's not going to work. Yeah, so I think f4, that's what he wanted. The, the problem is that um, yeah, he's looking for this thing, but there's queen a7, there is queen c8, and there is um, infiltration, and this knight doesn't control this guy. Yeah. So. Uh, there is no attack because knight on h4 cannot attack the king. Even if you play f6, the square is taken. All these squares are taken. There is no attack. So he plays h3, prepares king h2, f4, but rook c7. Yeah, but if, if you play h3, then maybe king h2 is necessary. Yeah? So he plays g4, okay. Queen d2, rook c5, protect. Not bad, actually. Um, black protects everything, white protects everything, counterattacks. Yeah, chess is played. And rook e8. Um, yeah, so white really wants to play f4, but you know, he doesn't have a chance. Yeah, I mean, f4 here and immediately 
some some attack here probably rook c3 like if you play f5 then queen c5 undoubtedly yeah and again f6 doesn't have any threats white cannot make any threats with the guy in here it's nothing uh yeah so he wants to play knight f5 which he does but then black gets to the key pawn on e5 this is a key pawn yeah if you if, if you lose this pawn then uh black is better so and now we arrive at this end game which is close to equal but it's not exactly equal um the problem with this end game usually bishop and two rooks are stronger than the uh, knight and two rooks but in this particular case um white has structural problems yeah these pawns doubled knight is untouchable black is protected and practically this is an extra pawn yeah because of the double pawn nature so there are two ways for white to play this either to try to put the bishop on b5 protect these guys and uh, take away some squares or you activate this rook because it's doing nothing you need this rook to be active and go on the seven all right so that's what the result does but he plays it um, uh, he loses the tempo he plays this move first he really need to play this and the idea is if rook c4 um, then you counter-attack the spawn first and then if rook protects then you move the rook here and if he plays d4 then you can safely play this move yeah um, so black must he cannot keep one of the pawns alive either this pawn falls or that pawn falls and now black is now white is a little bit better yeah look at the difference in the position active bishop active rooks passive stuff and white has some chance for an attack compared to this to this position yeah where the rooks are unclear the bishop is closed and uh, everything is closed so rook f3 was better but okay rook d4 is still playable black of course runs with his king immediately protect the pawn block the e-pawn and uh, yeah white is trying uh, finally get the rook here but rook c8 yeah king managed to successfully block the pawn and uh, rooks protect the king so now this is advantage for black and this pawn is clear weakness yeah black trades the rooks this is gonna be under attack so problem bishop f1 94 okay looks normal and knight goes to c3 uh, yeah it, yeah you know I, I i talked about it uh, previously but the time control for these candidates is extremely bad yeah this is good only if they want to you know find out who is the best uh, rapid player in the world but for the world chess championship uh, classical chess this is absolutely bad because this end game is extremely complicated um I'm doing the recap, I'm not doing the analysis. And but to do the analysis of this end game, you need at least like you know a week, okay? Because this position is bloody complicated, even for some of the best end game players in the world. Because this is so tricky. Um there's mutual weaknesses, yeah, potential, uh strong bishop, pawns, uh, but also connections. Yeah, this is very cut, very tough. Yeah, black goes for this knight raid on the pawn on a4, but now white has um, white is able to protect his weakness. The bishop blockades the pawn, and you can counterattack, right? So this is actually complicated. Um, yeah, I, I really didn't like this. I thought he had to play a five first uh, and keep this pawn as weakness. Okay, after a five, white is just better. It's amazing. Black was better. Now white is better. Yeah, this is tough. But after g5, f5, now this, you see the difference? This pawn is now protected. And now this is potential weakness. Crazy. Rook e4 is correct, but okay. Strong grandmasters. But, um, and f6 is incorrect. Um, he must take this. And play rook e2. And the threat is rook d7. So, black plays rook c7. And then... White must do something here. Like what? I don't know. Uh, maybe just king g2. So if black plays rook f6 here, try to win this pawn, then you can play just rook d5. Okay. So probably black uh, plays rook f4. 
but then you play this. Yeah, this is very hard to see with the four minutes on the clock. It's almost unrealistic. Okay, I see it only because you know I have the engine in front of me also, and um, I'm I'm trying to understand what the engine says. I'm trying to understand what the human mind says, and explain to you guys. Okay. So this little maneuver, rook t5, rook f5, keeping an eye on the check, removing the defender, and keeping an eye on this guy. Forces black to play rook f4, and after that, is dead draw, yeah? But, you know, it's it's all nuanced. Alirza played f6, he thought it was the same thing, but it's not the same thing, because he missed this move. Yeah, he blundered. It's actually amazing in this tournament, he blunders quite a lot. Uh, because after this blunder, he must be extremely, extremely careful. And he, but he finds the best moves. He plays this, um, and Black goes for this uh, crazy end game. We have another crazy end game. Absolutely crazy. Um, rook versus knight and two pawns. Traditionally, it's a draw. In this particular case, it's a weak pawn, and potentially Black King can run with this pawn. So. Uh, if we don't have eight pawns, it's probably a draw, but white must be a little bit careful. However, with the presence of these pawns, white gets an additional resource to attack this guy. And given the fact that this is a rook pawn, uh, rook pawn is notoriously difficult uh, to, de to deal for the side that has a knight. Because knight, you know, he cannot jump around this pawn. He must literally block this pawn in, in, in by body, okay? So... Okay, Alizar finds the correct defense, plays king f1, d3, king f2, uh, black takes, and now there is a little trick which was very hard to understand, but um, this is a critical mistake. Again, it's another blunder, yeah, it's another blunder with one minute on the clock, but this is the stuff where the title Tuesdays that Nakamura is famous for comes very handy. This is exactly the position from title Tuesday because black has three minutes, white has one minute for the rest of the game, and Nak is one of the best world players who understands the psychology when you have limited time like this on the clock, okay? He starts to create tactical problems for you which are not obvious, sets traps. This is one of the traps that he set, and white falls into this. Because after g3 this pawn is unstoppable, he thought he can play rook g8, and if knight g5, then king e2. It's a draw. But unfortunately for him, he missed g2 and this fork. So, but how do you play then? Yeah, how do you play this? Well, the answer is that you play this, and after g3, you have only one move. It's not rook a5. After rook a5, king g4, black is winning because the g pawn wins. You need to stop this pawn. Yeah, this is extremely counterintuitive and very hard to understand, but this is the only way. And um, you can grab this pawn because this trick doesn't work here. <laughs> the knight is not on c3. If the knight was on c3, it would be the same thing, but the knight is all the way on g5 and it's just drawn now. So, yeah, it, it's kind of amazing like how Naka set this trap. And uh, Alex, I just blundered into it. And this one blunder costs the half a point. The game goes from hard-fought game, which was very balanced, until this very moment. And in this moment, just one move unbalances the whole game. Amazing. Chess is very hard. All right. Uh, and then we have finally this game where Gukesh demonstrated his queen endgame expertise. Yeah, this was amazing, but okay, expected, yeah. Uh, all right, Petrov, another Petrov. So Jan tried Petrov, he ran into problems, and now Abasov plays Petrov. So Gukish plays, you know, he plays slowly. He doesn't want a big advantage. He doesn't want the mating attack. He just wants to develop his pieces, have comfortable game. Um, Black looks absolutely okay. Yeah, strong pawn chain, nice pieces, plenty of room for pieces. Uh, the problem is that um, I really don't like this move. It's, it's a little bit chicken move. Um, I think you might need the bishop here on this diagonal or on this diagonal. And then sort of try to create, because white wants to play bishop d3 and get rid of this guy. Yeah, Bishop c5 actually helps white with that. Because now 
Um, also, black traded the bishop and helped white to get the rook to the third, which means white is ready to fight for this file. Yeah, I, I really don't like the way Abbas have played this part of the game, but okay. Um, doing the recap, not the analysis. Knight d6, black wants to trade, otherwise white plays again rook here, knight d4, and gets rid of this knight one way or another. So black tries to trade this guy in his terms, trade the bishops, but the problem is now white has control of the e-file, which is huge. The only open file, the other files are semi-open, uh, but now this activity um, causes problems for black king again. Too many pieces, potential attack is coming, uh, he's trying to get some squares, queen c2, a little nod on this pawn because, you know, rook is stuck protecting it, potential opening the file for the alkyne gun, but also c4 is coming, yeah? c4, very nice break. The idea is that if you take uh, after queen c4, again, we, I said before, right, this king is a little bit open. And uh, this is a problem. If king h8, then the knight goes to e5, obviously. Right, and if king h7, uh, the problem is that it's g4. This knight is very unstable. You need this knight on d5, but if the knight is on d5, then this king becomes very open. And the, the knight doesn't get to d5 anyway. If he doesn't get to d5, then it's a big problem. White, white actually wins the knight because there's check, yeah. So, this is a big problem, and um, rook is stuck protecting this guy, this rook is protecting this knight, this knight has no squares, so suddenly we have this position where black seemed okay, and now he's just much worse, without doing anything, like, seriously, optically wrong. So, great play by Gukish, and c5, disconnecting the pawns from this guy. So, advantage white. Um, the question is, how do you play here? And this is a, also another problem, because while, you know, white pieces are nice and etc., you know, how to win, yeah. So, rook e4 uh, makes sense, the rook on e6 is done, and uh, repeats to win time, because white is down to 5 minutes, yeah. And the second rook goes to e4, white finds the plan. So, the Key to this position, White realizes, is that this guy on f5 holds everything together. The spawn, the squares, and protects the king. So White needs to get rid of this knight on f5. Um, that's what he is doing. So one rook attacks this knight from this side, and this rook is coming to f4, and also hitting the spawn. Okay, so, um, yeah, so rook f4, d3, and just grab the pawn. Yeah, because if d2, then yeah, you can play queen d1. Knight d2 is just a draw. But queen d1, and again, this knight is a um, big problem. Yeah, it's a big problem. Um, although I like queen a2 here. Because if you take this knight, black has queen c1 coming. Which is... Still better for white because you have to give this knight uh, back, but you still have an attack and a pawn. It's advantage, yeah? But the best move here is rook b4. Just deny uh, access to the c1 square. Black needs access to these squares. The pawn is hanging. At the same time, it's not really hanging because um, black can just go and pin the, the queen. But the rook comes, yeah? You take with the rook, that's the thing. That is the thing. And uh, next move, queen moves and white has two extra pawns, but if queen d5, then queen b3. Alright. Yeah, so, you know, players at, this, at their level, they must calculate all this stuff. Precisely. Okay. So, Abasa plays queen a2 immediately. Um, and white plays king h2. Just, you know, move the king away. He wants to trade stuff and go into this extra pawn position. Abbasov tries to go tactically, but queen b4, very correct. Protecting the pawn, stopping d2, attacking. Queen goes back, and um, yeah, this is sort of like, you know, time trouble move, yeah? One minute on the clock, Abbasov tries to play fast, tries to capitalize on white's uh, time trouble, and... Um, 
Yeah, the winning move is g4. If Gukish had more time, I'm pretty sure he would find us. Just here and knight f3, yeah. Knight f7 and possibly king g2. Once the king is moved from this um, pin, black is just lost. But okay, time trouble, right? So he plays rook e1, doesn't want to uh, feel pressure of this pawn winning. Now the rook can block it. Knight also goes to e5, and uh, white wants to consolidate. Yeah, he has three versus two here, and three versus two here. So his advantage is un undisputable. His only problem is the clock. He needs to stabilize his position, uh, get to the time control without blundering stuff, and then he wins the game. Easier said than done. So rook e8, rook e4, fighting for the file, correct. Rook takes, which is kind of logical based on his previous previous move on returning the rook. Queen takes e4 makes more sense, but okay, rook e4 is still playable. Rook here and knight d2. Um, white needs to make two more moves, two more moves to make the time control with less than a minute on the clock. And the position is not so easy. <laughs> and black tries to, you know, counterattack uh, using last two moves in. Yeah. 96 goes to here and he attacks this pawn. So black, yeah, and, and finally he he gets the mistake he was waiting for. Yeah, king g1 is a mistake. Uh, yeah, rook f4 apparently. Not the easiest move to find and g3. Yeah. Probably worried about something like this. Um, yeah, probably. And and then Queen B7 is the ancient move, but King G2 is probably a very human move. Like Knight F5 looks very scary, but in reality, after Rook E4, everything is protected and White wins the game. Yeah. So you know, uh, Abbas would guess the mistake because of the time trouble, but this is the last move. And white still has some advantage, yeah, but he has lost it. He has lost almost his entire advantage here. Uh, and black is almost fully equal, but not not fully, yeah. Um, now we have a new game coming um, because black won an important pawn and in the process actually managed to defend this critical pawn. It's still a little bit better for white. Now Kukish tries again. For some reason, Abbasov just gives this pawn on d3 without a fight. Uh, probably blunder. See, he tries to play very fast, tries to get Gukish in time trouble again. Uh, but that's a big psychological thing, you know. For the players who are not that experienced uh, in chess, and they see the opponent run into time trouble, they stop thinking. They just want to look for 2-3 move trap, and, uh, you know, make the opponent waste more time and blunder something. But it's a little bit amateurish approach and it also works in a tournament like Title Tuesday. Yeah, it, it did work today in the uh, Nakamura game, but it only works when you have like, when the opponent is down to like two, three minutes. Yeah. In this game, uh, White has still 16 minutes. It's a lot of time, a lot of time. Um, so he just calculates everything. See, Gukir spends 12 minutes on this move, it's a critical move, but he calculated everything and he saw that, you know, he's okay. So black plays this, knight f4, rook back, and rook g5, yeah. So rook, if rook d3, just queen c2. And um, it looks dangerous, but there is no mate. And king can go here or even to h2, yeah. Apparently king h2 is better. Yeah, and black cannot make use of this um, king factor because you know some stuff is still unprotected, and white is ready to um, protect everything next move. Advantage white. So rook g5 had to be calculated, and now this moment, this is a critical moment, and Kukish makes a small mistake. After queen c6, he is just completely winning. The point is that if black takes here, there is check and 94. And rook has nowhere to go along the g-file, the queen is too passive, cannot uh, attack the king, and white just wins the game, in addition to queen c3 check. So, uh, Gukish missed that, he plays the second best move, I guess, and now this gets very double-edged, yeah? very, very double-edged, still advantage to white. King h1, uh, king f1 
is a repetition of rook h2. And now this rook is stuck. Knight of six is a huge threat, and um, knight cannot move. Yeah. So I mean, he has to move the knight. Uh, there is no other way. What else can, can you do? Uh, there is no mates. No mates. The rook protects this square. You cannot get to the d1 square because uh, it's mine because of the check. Yeah. And rook has no moves. So knight d5 is the only move. Abbaso finds it, and now we have transition to this. Uh, queen endgame by force Where white is a pawn up. It looks very drawish, but uh, It's not so simple. Yeah, yeah, and and these grandmasters will demonstrate how difficult the queen endgames are This is this this game is perfect example Check repeats win the time chief or apparently mistake check wins with the check Okay, white repeats some moves and um, pushes the pawn apparently, it goes immediately from big advantage to small advantage, but again, with some time, push the pawn, but black is now checking and uh, I don't know how white avoids the checks. Queen d6, the only move to play for a win, no more checks, but the pawn is on h3 already. Uh, king of 7 okay, black has only one move, queen trades. Must, must trade the queens. And we have a new queens on board. Um, yeah. And this is uh, very hard to defend in Blitz. So, Gukish survived his time trouble. He has extra pawn. He is absolutely safe and he can, you know, safely play for a Windows game. And Black is in for a hard time because this is nightmare to defend position like this. King h5. Is winning for whites. Why? Don't ask me, I have no idea. We can talk about the geometry, like where the queen should be, but in reality, you know, no human can understand this position. This is the position where pretty much is, um, you know, understandable by computers only. Um, King f5, you know, see, makes a human move, tries to create mating threats and uh, trade the queens, but this is a critical mistake. <laughs> Yeah, but the computer finds the queen g2, queen g6 resource, after which it's a draw. Before this, it's winning, it's plus 6, but after this human move, it's a draw. So, human move, but it's a loss move. Queen f4, queen e5, and now white set up this perfect, beautiful queen in the center. The king is ready to rock, probably on f6, with a mating threat. Okay, check, and this is already a loss game, yeah, because queens are traded. Yeah, so it's amazing, yeah. In this position, which is draw, we went to lost position for black in five moves. In five moves from now, black is dead. Okay? Hard. This is actually very hard to understand. Yeah, but king h7 actually makes a lot of sense because if you... Uh, sometimes, you know, it does help to compare some complicated endgame to break it down into simpler parts. Like in the rook endgames, yeah? Um, in the rook endgames, the king should be always on the short side. So the rook can attack and give checks from the long side, yeah? Yes, yeah, so from, from this perspective, king h5, he sort of wants to bring his king behind the pawn, which makes sense, yeah? But there is just, it's, some, it's not gonna be possible, yeah? But if, he, if that is not possible, then the best idea is to keep the king on the short side again and then start giving checks. But that's the principle that, you know, you can sort of very abstract, yeah. Does it work? Maybe it doesn't work, who knows? Again, only the engines can understand this perfectly. Um, and you need time to play this, and these guys have two minutes. This is not uh, the, again, the time control is absolutely horrible. Uh, yeah, this is not the time control that should be used to decide the classical world chess champion challenger, yeah. If they want to find out who is the best rapid and blitz player, they're doing fine. Because, you know, this is a draw and the side should have, uh, the defending side should have time to defend this, to try to defend this, okay? So the lack of time now favors the side that has this extra pawn. I played the, some of the Queen End games uh, on the defending side and I can tell you that even the most drawish looking Queen End games with limited time, 
is it very difficult to to defend very difficult um nerves you you, you must have nerves of steel to defend stuff like that and and find uh, the correct defense all right so uh this was the last game uh i think we covered everything so this was the recap of the round five let's look at the round six lineup which is going to be later today we have a game between the leaders, Jan Nepomniši versus Fabiana Kurana. Jan is actually in a pretty good position. He is plus two. He is leading, okay. Right now he's leading with Gukes, but Fabiana is right behind them, okay. And then we have a bunch of people with 50%. Actually only two people, yeah. Naka, thanks to his win, suddenly went from last place to middle of the table. And the next win, if he does, it gets him into the third spot. Yeah, so every win is absolutely critical. Absolutely, because the tournament is so packed. I'll resign the last place, but if he wins two games, he will be right back at it. Yeah, he will get a chance. It's going to be very difficult, though. Um, but okay, so let's look at the predictions. Uh, Nepo versus Karana. Both sides, they don't have, uh, you know, much to lose or to gain from uh, trying to win very hard in this game. Yeah, they're both leading, the tournament's still ahead. Fabio will be very happy with the draw. Nepo, I think, will be okay with the draw also. He, you know, another game brings him closer to the end of the tournament. He's already at plus two. But he's playing white, and it would be not very wise to, at least not to put up a fight. So, we have a game between leader, Gukish and Naka. Naka just won a game, but Gukish also did. And uh, Naka has second game black in a row. Okay, this is a little bit complicated. Um, I think in a way this game is good for both players because um, it's going to be a fight. And uh, Gukish is not the player who is going to go for a draw. Yeah, He's going to play the position. He's going to go try to win. Um, he's also, it seems to be in this tournament, he likes to maneuver, play strategic chess. Naka... Is 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 it has a weird style of playing. Uh, I would call it a street brawler style. It's kind of something he brought from the uh, many years of playing in the American Open chess tournaments. In American chess open tournaments, if you want to survive, you need to win prizes, and to to win prizes, you need to play risky chess. At the same time, you know um, it has to be good chess also. Yeah, so. Like the previous game against uh, uh, Adriza showed his uh, this crazy mix. Yeah, he 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 his pieces went back, then forward, then back, then forward, then sideways. Yeah, it's like dancing all over the board. Crazy. Um, so there's gonna be fights. Uh, I'm curious. I think you know. Uh, I don't I don't see Gukish beating Naka here unless he catches him in some prep like Vidit does. But I don't think Gukish has that kind of prep. If Gukish had Vidit's prep, that guy would be unbeatable, okay? Pretty much. But he doesn't, okay? Vidit is Vidit and Gukish is Gukish. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't combine two. Um, so, um, probably, you know, uh, actually it's pretty dangerous for Gukish. You know why? Because uh, in his games, he showed that he constantly gets into time trouble. And Nakamura is... Definitely one of those players you don't want to end up with one minute on the clock. He's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna actually kill you. You're gonna get caught in some crazy trap, and uh, you're gonna lose. So I, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident this game might actually be a result. Either and it can easily Naka can win this. Actually, I think Naka's chances to win this game is higher than Gukish's chances to win this game. So. Um, for Gukish, it would be wise, you know, to just make a draw in this game. Because Naka is very, very dangerous. Um, and uh, Vidit versus Alriza. Well, okay, two, two outsiders playing each other. Um, and Vidit playing white. It's going to be another fight. Yeah, it's definitely going to be another fight. They have nothing to lose. And uh, Alirza is going to try to fight, but mo what was most likely to happen is that Vidit prepares something. And we're going to see another of those Vidit prep uh, lines. And um, 
you know, Andres is pretty good at figuring stuff out, so he will probably figure that prep out. And the question is, will this end up in a draw? Or is Vitit going to try to play for a win, yeah? Because uh, he played yesterday, he missed a win against uh, Fabiano. Uh, yeah. Uh, again, very interesting game. Very interesting game. Um, if Adrizai survives the prep, he has good chances. Um, good chances to, to strike. But the way I see it is that Adrizai now blunders stuff in this tournament. His tactic is not, not good. And uh, Vidit misses something, but, you know, he is still better in tactics. So I would say that Vidit's chances are higher, okay? Objectively speaking, I would say that Vidit's chances to win this game are higher. Um, I don't see a draw, but it is possible. Okay, but Prague versus Abbasov, I think, is going to be a draw. Um, I think it's going to be a draw because uh, Prague has really good prep, but he is... Is like you know he's fighting between trying to be dynamic and strategic, and uh, you also saw his um, yeah he went to the end game against Nepo right when while he could have gone for that um, attack. It, it, it's difficult to say you know difficult to say. But Abasov is not in the bad form. Prague is also not in the bad form. I mean these guys deserve to be in the candidates obviously. Um, the question is, who is better? I think at this point, Prague is better. Um, but is he going to be able to beat Abbasov? We'll see today, right? All right, gentlemen, that was the <coughs> recap of the round five. I'll do the recap of the round six tomorrow. We have in two hours Serena Kings. So if you want to ask me questions about the candidates or anything, um, after the Arena Kings, I will stay and we'll um, watch some of the live games, I guess. And um, we'll see how the things go. Alright, see you guys.